Let's everybody stand. We're going to turn to Hebrews chapter 12 for just a moment here. Hebrews chapter 12. Thank you for that great music. I've enjoyed hearing uh, the Crown College students sing and the Hiles Anderson College students sing. Always good to have a good college as represented. Praise the Lord. Good to see you all today, and it's been an honor and privilege for me to have a small part in this conference. I want to say a big thank you to Pastor Steve uh, Frost for uh, allowing me to stand in this pulpit, in this place. Thank the Lord, uh, Brother Reno, for these decades of friendship that we have all these many years, uh, preaching uh, when you were uh, running this conference many, many, many years ago with my good friend uh, Steve Robertson and Ron Riley. A lot of good memories, a lot of precious memories come back to our hearts and mind. That was a long time ago when Brother Madeline was the pastor and you were the youth pastor. Because I remember back in the days of Hiles Anderson when you were just a wee lad. All right, notice in verse number one, chapter 12 of Hebrews. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which just so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Let's remain standing. We'll have a word of prayer and then please be seated. Lord, for the other speakers that have already had their part, we're very thankful for the way that you've spoken to my heart as well as everyone's hearts. Now we pray as the other speakers come up and do their part, dear Lord, uh, Brother Tim, Brother Dean, uh, Brother Reno, Brother Pastor uh, Frost, we pray your blessings upon them. And should I have left out anybody I did not mean to, I just pray that you will have your will and your way in this place. Please, Lord, help me to convey to the young people that which is most life-changing for me, may it be for them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, please. I went to Baptist church nine months before I was born. I was reared up in church. That's all I've ever known. If my testimony were to sound dramatic, this is about as dramatic as I can get it. I was down in the gutter, wallowing in the muck and mire of this old world. I did everything there was to do until I was gloriously saved at the age of six. I was just a youngster. Years ago, I remember my uncle telling me, it is a good thing that God saved you when you were young because had you waited till you were older to get saved and you ever became involved in alcohol, you would have been a drunk, you would have been an alcoholic. So therefore, I want to say, you, be, you can be saved out of a life of sin or from a life of sin. And I'm thankful that for the most part that I've been delivered from a life of sin. I think about, even though I was sharing with you the couple of years that I was away from the Lord, I, I, I've, I've never been drunk, I've never taken drugs, and a lot of things I have done, but the Lord kept me from so much because of His saving grace and His power, being confident in this very thing that He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. I thank God for His sanctifying grace and power through the years. Like anybody, and as a preacher's son, I knew what it was for hypocrites to be in church or people that are saved that are not living up to their testimony. And I remember one time I was on old Durant Road in the back seat. My mom and dad were in the front seat. And uh, my sister had already gotten married. My brother was attending University of South Florida. And uh, we lived outside of Tampa, Florida. But I remember on old Durant Road heading to our place I remember saying, and when I was referring to the youth director, I said, if he says one more word to me, I'm going to clean his plow. And I remember my mother turned around, and I was ready for a scolding or a spanking or whatever you want to call it. I didn't know what was, I didn't know what was coming with Mama, I'm telling you. But I remember she got real serious, and I can still see her face in the moonlight of that night. And she said, Johnny boy, I want to tell you something. If you keep looking at men, they're going to let you down. You've got to look to Jesus. He'll never let you down. 
And now for the greater part of my life, I've tried to follow that advice. And so I have poured over the life of Jesus. I've read the red. I've read what Paul said about him, what Peter said about him, what John said about him, but above all, what God has said about him. And the Bible said here, looking unto Jesus, so much I could say about what I just read, lay aside not only the sin, but the weight. There are some things in my life that I don't even put into the category of sin, but I cannot do it. Others may, but I cannot. There are some things that are definitely sin in your life, and there are some things that are weights in your life. An evangelist was leaving for a meeting once. He was holding up the uh, shirt to the window, and his wife said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm thinking about packing this shirt, but I don't know if it's dirty or clean. And she said, if it's doubtful, it's dirty. And so there's some things in my life that I would say they're weights to my testimony, and I don't want to be weighted down. We, because we're compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses, there are witnesses observing where we are and what we're doing. And that's another whole subject. But in verse 2 it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and I love this, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down the right hand of the throne of God. Because of what he knew would happen as a result of the cross, he endured the cross for the joy that was going to come as a result of the effect of that cross. And then it summed it up, summed it up in verse 3, for consider him, give great thought, concentrate on, focus on Jesus. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, and here's what it says, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Young people, the antithesis is true. If we do not focus on Jesus, if we do not get centered on Him, our life will be off-center and we're going to be fainting. If we don't focus on Him, we will be giving out and giving up, burning out and burning up. Looking unto Jesus, consider Jesus, and that's what I want to speak to you on the today, consider him. Give thought to Jesus. This will keep you from fainting your minds. I think about what Romans 6 says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? How, God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, reckoning this to be so? For you have obeyed from the heart. Verse 17, Romans 6, that form of doctrine which delivered you. So what really keeps us going is not the arm behind our back, not the parent that is so godly. You know, I think about you, Brother Dean, one of the godliest women I know was your mama. You know, she's with the Lord now. She's not here, but here you are serving the Lord still. My dad's not here. He's been over 30 years. What keeps me going? Yes, thank God for the admonition of my father, but it's that one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. It's that one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. You can only go so long by doing the right thing because somebody's making you do the right thing. People have asked me, I remember my good friend Rick Martin, that great missionary, years ago asked me, long time before he was ever a missionary, he said, what's the one greatest truth your dad ever taught you? And I said, Rick, the greatest truth that my dad ever taught me was obedience to the unenforceable, doing right when there's nobody around to make you do right. Who you are in the dark is who you really are. And so what really is the focus of my life is Jesus Christ, and when I think about him, I can't give up. When I'm concentrating on him, I can't give up. And let's just think about this for the next little while. Consider him. Consider Jesus as the creative Christ. If you believe that Jesus began his life in the manger of Bethlehem, you don't see who Jesus is. He is the creator. He is the creator. If we were out there in South Dakota and we were standing next to a rock crawl canyon, and you were to see the unmistakable likeness of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln, and I'm your tour guide, and I say to you, after millions and billions of years, through erosion, through the sand, through the storms, through the ice age, these 
faces were formed. And what's interesting, it all happened in America, not in Russia. For the famous most president of the United States, famous president of the United States. So if I said all of that happened through erosion and millions and billions of years, you would say, our poor tour guide, he's three fries short of a Happy Meal. He's not dealing with a full deck. He's got a few cards missing. Both oars aren't in the water. The lights are on, but nobody's at home. You're crazy. That's the product of intelligent design. You are more than just simply a product of evolution and accidental coincidence. For if you look in the mirror today, you will see something such, so much more sophisticated than Mount Rushmore. Because Washington's eyes on that rock wall cannot see. Jefferson's ears cannot hear. Lincoln's nose cannot smell. But your nose can smell, your mouth can taste, you can speak, you can see. And when you look about, if you see and study how the eye works, you see things turn them upside down, your mind rearranges it and you see it the perfect way. You, how does that happen? Because God is your creator. Amen. Specifically, specifically, Jesus. Colossians 1, all things were made by him and for him. And without him was not anything made that was made, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things visible and invisible. We're talking about the new web microscope or telescope that's showing us things we've never seen before. Oh, my friend, there's so much more beyond the Hubble and the web mic uh, a telescope or even the microscope if you want to go there. Everything that man doesn't see, even he made it all. John 1, 1 through 3, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. Who was it that put the sun up yonder in the tabernacle of the heavens? Who was it that put the moon shining like a yellow John full in full bloom? Who was it that scooped out and made the places for the ocean and roped it off with sand and filled it up with water? And who was it that put the beautiful green grass upon this planet and then tacked it down with yellow daffodils? It was Jesus. Who was it that made you in the womb of your mother? It was Jesus. You're not the product of evolution. You're the product of divine creation. Specifically, Jesus made you. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God. Consider him as the creative God. Consider him, please, as the cradled babe. As my old friend Dr. Lee would say it like this, he came from the glory of heaven to the glory of earth, from the hallelujahs of heaven to the hisses of earth, from the joys of heaven to the jeers of earth, from the comforts of heaven to the curses of earth, heaven's bread for earth's hunger, heaven's joy for his sorrow, and there lay a babe in the manger of Bethlehem that never cried for spoiled attention, who never ever did anything that was wrong, for he was the Son of God. He was God the Son, truly God, truly man, not half God, half man, truly God, truly man. Consider him as the curate of Christ. Only time we hear after his baby experience, he's 12 years of age, and as the theme is of our conference, Jesus said to the scholars, and that was an interesting time, those three days, Remember, Jesus is the author of the book. He's asking the questions of the most educated men in the world at that time, even much more so than the philosophers of Greek and, and Rome at this time. And they cannot answer the questions he's given them, so he's answering them. That's why he keeps the high leaders of the religious world today on pins and needles because they are in the presence of a 12-year-old who happens to be God manifest in the flesh the kinesis has taken place and they're beginning to realize this is more than just a kid here now there's a lot of theory about what happened there's the great glastonbury theory that his uncle nicodemus took him to england and if you ever heard the song jerusalem it tells about did jesus walk on those hills when he was a teenager into england in india in other places, but that's spurious. They don't know this. So it's a period of silence. So we cannot say what happened between the time that he was 12 and what happened the time he was 30 years of age. But here's what we do know. John the Baptist baptized him. The Holy Spirit came down in the form of a heavenly dove and the Holy Father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. 
And Jesus was tempted of the devil for 40 days, 40 nights. And he came out of the wilderness doing miracle after miracle after miracle, the curative Christ. There never were any blinded eyes, young people, that he couldn't touch and make see. There never were any mute mouths that he couldn't touch and make talk. Never any deaf ears that he couldn't touch and make them hear. Never any crippled withered hands that he couldn't straighten out. Never were any twisted withered legs that he couldn't say, take up thy bed and walk. And I want to just say this, he's still in the healing business. There may be some of you that have a broken heart. Jesus can heal that broken heart. Maybe some of you right here have been abused by people that were supposed to be people that were supposed to help you, and you've been abused, maybe sexually, emotionally, physically, some way, but I'm telling you that Jesus Christ is the divine healer, and he's still available. Consider him as the curative God. Consider him as a cradled babe. Consider him as the curative Lord. Consider him as the crucified Christ. I have to tell you, in all my studies of Jesus, nothing moves me more than when I consider what Jesus did for me. In light of what he did for me is my greatest motivation of what I can do for him. If we're to capture the essence of the cross, I think that we should start right after the Lord's table. He instituted the Lord's Supper for the first time. And he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He takes the cup. This is my blood, which is shed for you. And the Bible says, and afterwards they sung a hymn. You ever notice that? You see, there's a group of Passover psalms that are sung. And the last psalm to be sung at the Passover is the 118th psalm. Jesus was with his disciples heading toward Kidron's Brook, ultimately into Gethsemane, and he is singing the 118th psalm. I've often wondered what did it sound like? Did he have a beautiful baritone voice? Did he have this great tenor voice? I know that God's always been in the singing. uh, 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 Zephaniah 3.17 says that he joys over us with singing. Isn't that amazing? There are times that God looks at you and he's so filled with joy over who you are that he just breaks out in a song. I'm wondering what Jesus has sung over you. He's singing the 118th psalm. This is Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Bind the sacrifice with cords, even to the horns of the altar. If you were to draw a line between the horns of the altar and to be the perfect shape of the cross, and the Lord Jesus was singing, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Jesus celebrated the Passover with the disciples on the day before the Passover because there were approximately 5 million Jews in Jerusalem at the time of our Lord's Passover. That's why the Religious Pharisees got nervous on the day that he rode into Jerusalem and they were saying, Hosanna, which means save now. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. And they said, the world has gone after him. They were lifting up the palm branches. The palm branches were left over from the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Feast of the Tabernacles, they used green palm branches to hold up the thatch roof. But they saved a couple of them for Passover because they would spread out like a broom and they would sweep their house clean when they were getting ready for the Passover. It's now the Passover and they have the palm branches ready to keep their house clean for the Passover. When they raised up the branch to Jesus, they were saying, sweep us, clean us, get rid of the Romans, get rid of the Pharisees, get rid of the hypocrites, make us clean, clean it up. And that's what he was doing when he walked into the house of God and said, my house should be called the house of prayer. And he was turning over money changers. He was sweeping it out, getting ready for the Passover. What they did not know and realize, everyone, that he was to be the Passover. So he celebrated the disciples with his his disciples the day before the Passover. You want to know why? Because the population of Jerusalem was so big, they had to split it up two ways. So the northern district celebrated the day before, and Judea and Benjamin celebrated the day of the Passover. All of the disciples came from the northern district except for one, and that was Judas Iscariot. What a coincidence. It's not a coincidence because Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples so he could become the Passover the next day. So he sings the 118th Psalm. This is the day which the Lord hath made. It's a day of sovereign design. Jesus did not die a martyr's death. He died like a king that marched to the barrels of victory. He knew what was happening to a degree. 
If you notice what it says over there in Mark's gospel, and this is an interesting passage of scripture I want to bring to your attention. In the gospel of Mark, chapter number 14, it says in verse number 32, and they came to a place which was named Gethsemane, which means the olive press. And he saith to his disciples, sit ye here while, while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and very heavy. Now that's an interesting phrase. I was talking to the um, Sunday school teacher, the, the workers a while ago about there are some translations when we look at it, it's difficult sometimes because in the changing from one language to another, we always don't get it. But here it says that Christ began to be sore amazed. And the Greek language that's more than just simply surprised. In 1982, the American military came up with a term that one of the Greek scholars in America said really revealed in a word what that means to be sore amazed. It means shock and awe. That's what happened on Desert Storm when the bombs begin to drop and the American troops begin to run. Saddam Hussein's men were just literally in shock and awe. The same way when you see a fireworks show and you see the fireworks show where we're in awe, but we're not in shock because we don't believe we're going to be hurt. When these guys are seeing bombs bursting all around them, they're in shock and awe because of what they can do. It's an amazing thing because Luke chapter 2 says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. You see, herein is a divine conundrum. In other words, he's God. That means he has all the attributes of God at his disposal any time. Omnipotence, God's all-powerful. Omniscience, he knows everything. Omniscience, he knows everything, rather. Omnipotence, he has all power. Immutable, he ne can never change. He's always himself. Yet the Bible says, and this is what Philippians 2 says of the kinesis, when he became a man, he chose to pull back only in temporary moments all of that omnipotence. Not, in other words, normally he's walking on land, but if he decides to be omnipotent and walk on water, he can do that. Normally, he's learning in wisdom and stature, Luke chapter 2, but then he can pull back and say to Nathaniel, I saw you under the tree. You know, before you saw me, I saw you under the tree. Omniscience. And here is a case where our Lord, watch this, he learns the will of the Father like a man, but he cannot resist it because he's God. So when he comes into the garden, it says, he began to be sore amazed. He began to be sore amazed. For three and a half years, he's been telling everyone he's going to die. Even when we follow him, he uses the term, take up a piece of execution. Take up the cross and follow me because he's headed to the cross. He said, destroy the temple. I'll raise it up on the third day. He knew he was to die. What puts him in the shock and awe? I submit to you what puts him in the shock and awe is the revelation that is given to him of the Father. And what would that revelation be? I feel like I'm on holy ground when I do this, but I can imagine the Lord having this dialogue, not monologue, but dialogue between he and the Father. Father, I'm now prepared for the time has come. Remember, just before Gethsemane, sometime after he crossed Kidron's Brook, which is now stained blood, because as I estimated, there were 275,000 lambs that were killed in the in the week of the Passover for the Lord, during the time that the Lord died. It's during this time, just before he crossed Kidron's Brook, he prayed, John 17, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I know why I'm here, but there's something that places Jesus into the shock and awe, into the sore maze. And he began to be in shock and awe. And the Bible says, very heavy. How heavy? Here's what he says. And saith unto them, verse 34, Mark 14, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Terry, here and watch. This is not hyperbole. This is not exaggeration. This is not, this is not metaphor. This is not analogy. This is literally true. He said, what I'm experiencing is killing me. Parenthetical. He died with a broken heart. You know that, don't you? Oh, yeah. 
Psalm 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierced my hands and my feet. They put the spear into his side. Out flow blood and water, for the water, for the heart is in a sack of water. When your muscle, the heart breaks, it breaks the watery sack, and the blood and water go into your stomach, down into the bowels. They put the spear into his side. Out flow blood and water from the broken heart of Jesus. And the Bible said in Psalm 22, my heart is like wax. It has melted in the midst of my bowels. He has given information that is so traumatic that it breaks his heart. My soul is sorrowful even unto death. By the way, that's not exaggeration. Hebrews 5, 7, in the days of his flesh, he was heard strong, strong crying and tears and was delivered from death in that he feared. What was that? That was referring to Garden of Gethsemane. He was almost killed from the news that was given to him. Dr. Luke writes it like this. He sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Where does your blood come from? Where does your sweat come from? Your bloodstream. Dr. Luke says that God the Father sent an angel and strengthened Jesus to keep him from dying in the garden so he would die at the cross. And then it says this in Mark, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death, he went, a little, he went forward a little, verse 35, and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine, but as thou wilt. At other places, not my will but thine be done. But notice he says here, Luke says, or Mark says it like this, Abba, Father, the word Abba is an Aramaic word, and it's one of those words that's difficult for us to understand what it means. Yes, it does mean a very affectionate word for daddy, but it means more than this. A scholar of the original language was over in Israel, and he said, I got insight in the restroom when two Hasidic Jews, a man and his boy, came to the restroom. As his boy was at the water, washing his hands, the father said this, when I command you and give you a command, call me Abba. So the father was giving us insight what Abba means. It means, yes, affection, but it means you're the boss. You call the shot. You are the Lord in this family. That's what Sarah called her husband Abraham, Lord. He is the curios. And the curios, Jesus, Lord, said, the Lord said unto my Lord, he says to the father, Abba! Oh, affectionate Papa, you are the boss. If it be possible, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, 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 let my will but thine be done. Abba, Abba. What was the information that was given Jesus that broke his heart and would have killed him? had not an angel been sent. My father, I'm ready to die. My son, you know the time is ready. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I'm ready to die for the sins of mankind, for the sins of mankind. My son, I need to give you the information further. And that, what is that about my father? That is, you must die for Johnny Pope, for Reno Likens, for Stephen Frost, for Dean Miller, for Tim, for all of us. Barbara, for all of us. Yes, my father, I'm ready to die for them, but for the death to be efficacious, for the death to be vicarious, a mystery will take place, but it will happen. You must become them. Father, you must become Johnny Pope. You must become... Remember what Habakkuk says, thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil. More painful than the nails and the whip is this. The Bible says, thou shalt see the travail of his soul and be satisfied. But if I become that, that means the Trinity is severed. This has never happened. Abba! Is there any other way? No, my son. 
John 18, Jesus rose up now dripping in blood. He says to Simon Peter, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? What was that cup? That cup is found in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. For he, that's the father, hath made him, Christ the son, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Consider him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Remember when Jesus got up in prayer, Peter pulled out the sword and he de-eared Malthus. I can see Malthus squalling like a dying calf in a hailstorm. <laughs> ah! Ah! And Jesus grabs the ear and puts it on hush. Thank you. And then Peter is told, put up the sword. If I wanted to, Peter, there are 12 legion of angels. Now, I want you to let this get in your mind. 12 legion. What's that mean? A legion is somewhere, watch this, 12 legion, I'm going to cut to the chase. 12 legion is between 72 and 144,000. So let's take the bottom number. Peter, put up your sword because right now there are 72,000 war angels of heaven led by Michael that are going to pull out flaming swords and come down here and deliver me. I don't need your pen knife. Put it up. Would, would that be, what would that do? It's hard to say what that would do, but I will tell you this. In the Old Testament, one angel, uno, senor. Eh, que pasa, que pasa, que pasa. One, uno. How do you like that, huh? People say, where do you live? I said, northern Mexico. But anyway, look it. <laughs> hey, one angel in the Old Testament killed the, hun listen, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. One, uno. 185,000 soldiers. Tough guys. Can you imagine what 72,000 really bent out of shape angels could do? Jesus said, that's who's waiting right now for me to say, come. How ironic, come, here they come with shackles, the band up the hands that made the bands, and Orion and Pleiades created the heavens of the earth. Lights, torches that take away the light of the world. I must hasten. The Sanhedrin meets at an un unlawful time for them to meet. 40 different guys come and slug him in the face, hit him with the open palms of their face, pluck the hair out of his face, they spit on him. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. They take him to Pontius Pilate. Pilate is as nervous as a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs, especially when his wife says, have thou nothing to do with this just man? I suffer many things this day in a dream because of him. He sends them to Herod. Herod wanted to see a miracle. Jesus never does a miracle to entertain anybody he didn't say a word to that fox and Herod sent him back to Pilate Pilate is now totally exasperated not knowing what to do he sends him to the torture you see the mercenaries are now taking care of him not just the regular Roman army the mercenaries that are brought in for the torture they play the game of top that let's see who can hurt him the worst they strip him naked they tie his wrist together, according to Ed, Howard, uh, Alfred Edersheim, and they stretch him until the toes bang, tangle off a little, the floor a little bit or until they're just barely off the floor. They take that strong whip with sharp bone on the end of it, and they pull it back, and they throw it into his body. With the centrifugal force, that sharp bone falls into his flesh as easy as a pebble falls into a pond, and then they yank that whip back, and because of the stress position, not only did it cause a cutting sensation, but it caused a ripping sensation that according to Roman history, it was not unusual at all for a man to be ripped right in half of the Roman whipping post. That reminds us that our Lord was every inch a man. He was a man's man, strong muscles from felling trees and lifting stones in the carpenter business. They put that purple scarlet robe about them. It soaks up like a sponge so that when they do take it off, it tears off the, the scabs again. His face is now covered with scabs where the flesh or where the hair used to be. They take a crown of thorns, not like thorns you're used to here in the east, but more like Arizona or West Texas thorns, some six to nine inches in length, sharp as a needle in the end, strong nearly as a ten-penny nail, and they intertwine these 
thorns in such a way that from a distance they looked like a crown. When they placed it upon our Lord's head, they didn't shove it. They didn't want to tear up their own little lily hands to do it, but they put the firm reed into his hand, not like a bamboo fishing pole piece. This is like a small baseball bat. So they bowed the knee, mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then somebody takes that firm reed and they pound it over his head, driving the crown of thorns into the scalp until the end of the scalp until it finally scrapes the skull and great bubbles of blood fall down over the scab regions of his face. No wonder Isaiah 52, 14 says, as many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred more than any man. C.I. Schofield was correct when he said his form didn't even look human. He shall grow before him, Isaiah 53, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. When we should see him, we should desire him. And that's not referring to his life. That's referring to the cross because it went on to say, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, despising the shame of that cross for the joy that is set before him. For consider him, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Consider him as that crucified Christ. They pull that scarlet robe about him and they're ready to walk him up with a seamless robe that's only left. His body has been so ripped apart that his rib cage is literally exposed. That's why the prophecy says a thousand years before he died, I may tell all my bones that they look and stare upon me. He's heading up the Via Della Rosa, the way of the pain. He tells the daughters of Jerusalem to weep not for me, but for yourselves. He's heading up to the cross. No man takes it from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. He's not dying the martyr's death. He's dying like a king that marched the barrels of victory. The cross is laid down upon Golgotha. He lays upon it. Nobody has to curse him. And they drive the nail into the top foot as that hammer hits the nail. And the capillaries and the veins begin to break and begin to spray. He finds no comfort on the cross as he puts his head back. The crown of thorns prick him again. They nail the other hand. One foot's laid on top of the other foot and they're pounding that nail into the foot until finally it's bruised. Our evangelist young man in our church, David Korn, said he had studied the word bruise and it's the most painful word that is used to express pain in the Hebrew language. He was bruised for our iniquities. They raise that cross up into the air, falls with a sickening thud. You can hear the bones fall out of joint. And from that cross, he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And every time for whosoever will shall call upon the name of the Lord, that prayer is answered. The thieves are railing against him. One of them wises up and says, Lord, remember me when thou enterest of thy kingdom. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. There's weeping Mary at the foot of the cross. He doesn't say mother, but he says woman. In other words, don't look at me as your son, but now as your savior, you gave me the first birth, I'm giving you the second one. I've given you the second one. Behold thy son, behold thy mother. By the way, tell me what you think about your mother. You're pretty much telling me what kind of Christian you are. Jesus took out time to honor motherhood right there at the cross. On that cross, he says, now I'm rearranging the order a little bit for a reason. He says, I thirst, I thirst. You know, the last time we heard anything about drinking was back in the crawl, back in the garden when he, Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. He says, I thirst. It's as if he's, and the Bible says he does it to fulfill all scripture. And the father says to the angels, take the cup now and give it to him. All of it, the last bitter dregs. You know, when we have the Lord's Supper, when the Lord took the elements of the Passover, it was a lamb, it was the bitter herbs, it was the cup, it was the bread. All that's left is the bread. And the cup. You want to know why? Because Christ became the lamb and Christ took the bitter herbs. We don't. I thirst! And the sin of mankind is placed upon him and all the lights of the universe go out. Yes, all the lights. This is no eclipse. The Egyptian hieroglyphics make a statement about it that let us know that it was dark in Egypt. 
in, the, in, in, in Ireland, the lights went out and the high king of Ireland panicked and ran out into the courtyard and dropped dead as saying, surely God must be dying today. Darkness over the whole land. God turns out the lights. God turns out the lights. From the midst of the darkness, Jesus cries, Eli, Eli, have a sabachthani. And that is a say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What happened? The Bible says not to grieve the Holy Spirit, not to quench the Holy Spirit. He's the heavenly dove. And for those of you who have ever been dove hunting, you know it doesn't take much to put a dove to flight. It doesn't take much sin to grieve the Holy Spirit and take his power from you. When Jesus was taking the sin of all mankind and women as well as men upon his own person, the Spirit said, I can't stay here. And the Spirit of God that came upon him at John's baptism vacates and Jesus cries out as the Holy Spirit goes up from them, My God! And then I can see 72,000 war angels now fully pulling the swords out and the Father says, Resheath thy sword! But, but Father! They who waited upon the Son for millenniums. But Father! Turn around! But! Turn around! Resheath thy sword! And they can't believe it as the Father himself begins to turn and the angels, the cherubim, fold those wings. Remember the Old Testament tabernacle and temple, the cherubim that had the wings? They fold their wings down. And if ever angels had tears, I believe they have tears now as the Father turns his back. And as the Father turns his back, the Son of God said on the second time, My God! Why hast thou forsaken me? God! Forsaken of God, the Holy Trinity severed as Christ dies alone! Becoming me, becoming you. I don't want you to dwell on this, but think for just a split second about the worst thing you've ever done in your life. Well, that's what Jesus became on the cross for me and you. The worst thing you've ever done. The worst thing you've ever been. The worst thing. In the darkness of that cross, as we come toward the end of it, he cries out. It is finished! It's one word in the Greek. Tetelestai! It was the same word used by the farmer when he brings his lamb to the priest. If it's fit for Passover, no flaw, no blemish, he says, Tetelestai. It's pure. It can be sacrificed. It was the same word used by a man who had just completed a masterpiece. Maybe a sculptor or a painting, he steps back and says, Tetelestai, no more strokes, no more cuts. It's done. Masterpiece. It was the same word used by a man who's in debtor's prison. He can't pay his way out. Usually a benefactor, usually a, a family member pays his debt. He has these ordinances that are written against him of the laws that he broke. And when all of his debt was paid, then it was stamped, Tetelestai, paid in full, Prison door open, he's free. It was the same word used, and this is my favorite way it's used. When the Cyclops were in battle, they were comparable to our Navy SEALs, Marine Recon, uh, Army Green Beret. Their job was so dangerous that if they overcame the enemy and the enemy were thoroughly defeated and could not fight again, then the runner would run back, a runner specified to run back to Athens would greet the mothers and the fathers, sweethearts and wives, sons and daughters, moms and dads, grandparents, uncles and aunts, who were on pins and needles. How are the Cyclops? How are the Cyclops? If it was an overwhelming victory, the runner would run back and jump into the air with his last out-of-breath breath and scream out, Titanis Tai! When they heard that, they jumped for joy. This is the day which the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. That's what Jesus said when he was saying, it is finished. He wasn't saying it's finished to his life. He was saying it's finished to salvation's plan. I am the Passover, no flaw. Every time it said, thou shalt not, I did not. Whenever it said, thou shalt, I did. I fulfilled what you could not. I'm the second Adam. First Adam blew it. I'll be your Adam to get you in. 
Nothing can be added now. It's a masterpiece. The debt has been paid. The victory has been won. It is finished. And then the Bible says he bowed the head and gave up the ghost simultaneously with the veil of the temple ripping from the top to the bottom. I have been on Calvary. And you could easily hear the voice of one who raises it from Gordon's Calvary to the temple. And when they were officiating in the temple, that curtain, which was six to nine inches in thickness, it took two yoke of oxen to get that curtain up, but it was rent not from the top, or from the bottom to the top, but it was torn from the top to the bottom. God Almighty went whoom when Jesus cried out, it is finished. And they could hear Christ's voice screaming, T. Tally Rip! And the Holy of Holies is exposed and the Ark of the Covenant. But that's okay. It's not Indiana Jones. Nobody died because now there's no need for that because we have now the mercy seat in heaven. Which reminds me of what Christ did at the moment of his death. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And the Bible said he bowed. He didn't drop it Hollywood style. He bowed his head. No man takes it from me. I have the power to take, lay it down. I have the power to take it up. He bowed his head and he gave up the ghost. And the Bible says, he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. What happened? What happened? What happened? If you look at the chronological Psalms sequence of the passion, you have Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierced my hands and my feet. That never happened to David. It wasn't even proper to die by the cross at that time. But what was happening? That was prophecy of Jesus on the cross. Then Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death. Now there's darkness at the cross. Then Psalm 24. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. The Bible says that he offered himself without spot to God through the eternal spirit. Hebrews 9, 14. He offered himself without spot to God through the eternal spirit. Up, 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 up. Jesus went through the eternal spirit. The angels are just now starting to, starting to turn around. And Jesus is on the outside. The bottom part of Psalm 24. Open up your gates and be ye lifted up and the king of glory shall come through. Open up your gates and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come. Who is the king of glory, Gabe? Well, Michael, the Lord, whoa, who? And Jesus cries, the Lord strong and mighty and battle is he. Open up, Mike, that's Jesus. And Jesus literally through the eternal spirit comes into the throne room and the father turns back around. That's what happened in Genesis 15. That's the covenant. Jesus has now been cut for the covenant. And now the father turns around just like the covenant of Genesis 15. And the father faces the son and Jesus the son places his own blood on the altar in heaven, on the mercy seat in heaven. In essence saying, Father, this is my blood for their sin. Tis done! Tis done, the great transaction's done. Consider him as the crucified Christ. Consider him as the coffin Christ. He was there for three days and three nights, but consider him as the conquering Christ. I did this paper years ago in college, and it's kind of a combination of John Milton's Paradise Lost and camp meeting preaching. But imagine, imagine the demon we're calling death is guarding the grave of Jesus. And as the demon of death is guarding the grave of Jesus, the devil comes by and says, Death, do you have him? Oh, listen, devil, I got him like all the rest. I got him like David. I got him like John the Baptist. I've got him. Speaking of David, the Bible says, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Where's corruption? Corruption? Yeah, where's the demon corruption? Well, I'm sure he'll show up any time now. We work hand in glove. Where is he? I, I, I don't know. Uh, he'll show up. The devil walks away and death says, Corruption! Where are you? Hurry up and get here. Do your thing. Morning the second day, oh, slew foot Satan slurks by. Death! Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yes, your satanic majesty. Do you have him? I've got him. He didn't just swoon. He died. He's dead. And the devil says, fine. Where's corruption? Corruption? Oh, he's not here yet. Where is he? I, I, I don't know, but we always do this together. He, he won't Fail me now. He better not. Morning of the third day before the devil get very close, old demon death throws his hand through his face and says, Look out! Look out! I can't hold him. I can't hold him any longer. Up from the grave he arose. 
a mighty triumph for his foe. Hallelujah, Christ arose. Corruption never showed up. Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Hallelujah. I imagine the devil now so mad. He's riding in the tomb of Jesus. Throws one talent to one side of the tomb. Another talent to the other side. And there Jesus is folding the napkin. Placing it by itself. I'll be back. And the devil says, where are you going? Jesus says, out of here. I didn't give you permission. And Jesus said, I didn't ask. And the devil says, no! In him are all the promises. Yay and amen to the glory of God. And I can see Jesus as he raises that foot and he grins at the devil. And the devil sees that hole in his foot and he remind, he's reminded of Genesis 3.15. Thou shalt bruise his hill, but he shall bruise thy head. And the devil says, get your face off my foot. Get your foot off my face. I got it messed up. I got all excited there. Get your... Get your foot off my face. And Jesus says, I will, but you've got something that belongs to me. And he reaches down and grabs the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Mm. And take that. And up from the grave he arose. So the devil, you have heard it said, the devil's alive and well on planet Earth. No, 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 no. He's alive, but he's not well. He's a wounded, bad lion seeking whom he may devour, but greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. And I want to tell you what keeps me going is the conquering Christ, the crucified Christ, the curative Christ, that cradled Christ, that creator God. When I consider Jesus, that's what keeps me going. And in light of who he is, and in light of what he's done, how can we do less than give him our very best? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many can say I'm saved and I know it? I'm as sa I listen, I'm as sure of heaven as if I were there right now. If you can say that, would you raise a hand? I know that I'm saved. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. You can put your hands down. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. How many would say Johnny Pope? I don't know for sure I'm saved, but I don't want to go to hell. I would like to know for sure if I die now, I go to heaven. I'd like to know for sure that I'm saved. Pray for me. Would you lift the hand? Is there one? I see a young man in a blue shirt right over there to my right. Then I see somebody else over here, a young lady to my left over there in the green. I believe it is dark green. You can put your hand down. Anybody else pray for me? I just don't know for sure if I die now I go to heaven, but I don't want to go to hell. Pray for me. Anybody else? Would you lift that hand? I love to pray for you. Oh, have you been to Jesus? I didn't ask you, are you a saved? Or I didn't ask you if you're a church member. I didn't ask you if you've been baptized. And I'm not trying to put doubt in anybody's mind. I just want to know, are you saved? Have you made this personal? You see, young people, listen to me. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, it's never real for you until it's personal. Yeah, but my mom and dad are saved. They told me they remembered when I got saved. Wait a minute. God has no grandchildren. I'm not saved because my daddy saved or my mama saved, and they were. I'm saved because there was a time and place in my life when I came to Jesus directly. Is there anybody else that would say, pray for me? I don't remember any time that I directly came to Jesus and got saved. Pray for me. Would you lift a hand as there one? Another one, another one. Thank you. Anybody else? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I wonder how many saved young people would say, Brother Pope, I'm saved by the grace of God. But as we went to Christ and as we viewed one more time the cross I realized more than ever in light of what he did for me in view of what he did for me I'm not I'm not living the life that I should live when I consider him but today I'm considering Jesus like I've never considered him before and I want to live for him every day of my life when I look at that cross brother Pope God spoke to my heart. That's me. Would you lift the hand? Is there a hand lifted? Well, from every section I he see hands lifted all over the place. Okay, you can put your hands down. Heavenly Father, you've seen the hands of the Christians saying, in light of the cross, in view of the cross, in view of Jesus, as we consider Jesus, we must therefore live for him, for you, Jesus, every day of our life. I pray for these that raise their hands saying, I want to be saved. I need Jesus. I pray that they'll come and get this settled right here, right now and not put it off. 
bind the hands of Satan, allow the Holy Spirit to do his work for the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, you said, there's liberty in Jesus' name, amen. Let's everybody stand. First of all, I wanna do this. Christian friend, I wanna ask you to come in just a moment, but right now, mainly, I wanna ask those of you that raised your hand saying, I'm not saved, I want you to come to me Give me your hand or Brother Likens over here and say, I want to be saved, all right? Come on down here. Or I tell you what, let's go ahead and throw it open. There's, you're already coming. If you are saved and God spoke to your heart, you feel free to come. Those of you that are not saved, you come on down. I'll find you in just a moment. I'll show you the way I'm going to find you. But if God spoke to your heart that you're not living for Jesus and you are saved, how can you when you look at the cross, how can you? Do anything less than give him your best. Would you come as we sing?